Good morning, everybody. Guys, do you want to come and take your seats? Really would encourage you to come and fill up from the front. Well done. We're going to be live streaming today, so uh, if there's people joining us on live, on, online, I should say, you're very, very welcome. Um, <clears throat> we send out an email every week, a very comprehensive email with all sorts of information about everything that's going on. Can I encourage you, if you receive it, to read it? We spend a lot of time trying to get everything on there. If you would like to receive it, you can get one of these cards here. Um, it's, it's on our Get Connected desk, which is just as you come in. You'll see it over there. Please fill it in, hand it to one of the welcome team, and we'll make sure that you get that email every week. Um, we will not take up like a formal offering. We don't do that as part of our gathering. But we would encourage you to think about what your kind of, I don't know, what your worship looks like. Because worship touches every area of our lives, doesn't it? And actually what we do with our money uh, can figure uh, in our worship life. So I just want to say that we don't take up an offering, but if you'd like to, as part of your worship this morning, just give towards the life of this church, investing in all the kingdom stuff that we've got going on. And there's a box by the, the hatch there, or there's a little machine. Um, Lily, give us a wave. By Lily waving right now, there is a little machine. <laughs> and uh, you can give... Make your offering, and you can do it online too. And it's worth saying that all of the activities that happen in the life, life of the church are online too, aren't they, Graham and John? We work very hard to make sure that they're on that, our website too. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to City Life Church here this morning. It's great to all be together. This is one of those Sundays when we are not east, west, and central. We are all in this one place. Good to be here, isn't it? Even in the rain, I just patted, I patted Lily on the, on the shoulder as I walked past and she was, she was sodden. She was wet through, <laughs> timed it really wrong. Did anyone else get caught in the rain as they came here this morning? <laughs> anyway, don't know why I'm saying that. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. We're going to worship God together. Let's just, all of us, quiet in our hearts before the Lord this morning. Father, we want to worship you this morning. We want our, our worship to be in spirit and in truth. We want our worship to lift your name high. And Lord, as we lift your name high, we want to humble ourselves before you. We just say together we, we love you. We're so thankful to you for all that you've done, even the, the downpours of rain. And we thank you, Lord. Praise you for your goodness and your love. We thank you, Lord, today for Jesus, for all that he has done and is doing. And we want to celebrate that in our worship now. Lord, would you come and be amongst us? We, Lord, believe that's true. And so, right in this moment, we turn our minds and our hearts towards you. You are the risen Lord Jesus. You are present amongst your people. You live and dwell in our hearts, Lord. And we bless you and thank you for that today. And we worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Singing at the ancient gates There's a melody of ceaseless praise Age to age The sound is only growing stronger There's a name the name of names There is seated on it one who reigns And his kingdom now 
is here and getting closer. Praise Him like we're there in glory. Here and now He's just as worthy. Jesus, He's so worthy of it all. He exists in everlasting life. So on heaven street there is no night. Every tear is wiped away. We'll know no sorrow. Worship him with joyful sound. Sing until your voice is out. No matter where or who's around, release your worship. Worship him. Oh, worship him with joyful sound. Sing until your voice gets out. to this. But he chose me. And I saw where I was. And what he's brought me into. And I thought one day when I heard it that I can't leave all this behind. And he called me into it. He called me to a place that I never thought would be so wide and so deep and so high. Yeah. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love 
your heavens, see the moon and the stars you set in motion, oh God, I sing glory and honor, what is man, you are mindful, son of man, you would care for him, we sing glory and honor, oh Lord, our Lord, oh how awesome Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. All the earth you gave to men, to your children, and you crowned them, O oh God. With glory and honor, so we'll sing of your name in our lives through your greatness, O oh God, and your glory and honor. O oh Lord, our Lord, how awesome are your ways, how majestic is your name in all the earth.
Father, we, we know the storms are raging and there are mountains that need moving in our world today. In Israel, in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, in the Ukraine, and Lord, in other places that some of us will have on our minds and hearts. We know the storms are raging. We know the world is being shaken. And we want to stand in unity in this place today as we pray. I want to read some words of Jesus over these situations. And I want them to be our prayer. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Lord, we are crying out to you today. Would you rise up the peace, the peacemakers in those places? That bombs from whichever side they're coming would stop. The children, families, people would stop being killed. That hostages would be released. Blessed are the peacemakers. Would you raise up the peacemakers in that place, Lord? Lord, even those who are making war in their hearts at this moment, Lord, would you shape, change, impact their hearts that they would become the peacemakers in that place? We are so in agreement here in this place, Lord. When a world is divided, we are in agreement. Let peace reign. We speak the shalom, the shalom of God over these places, over these hearts, over these people. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray sometimes. All I know is my heart is aching. I'm breaking, I'm deeply troubled as I look on. So help us, Lord, as we pray. Give us faith that we, we pray in a way that is powerful, is effective, does make a difference. Come, Lord Jesus, we need your help. They need your help. hope of the nations. Reveal yourself, Lord. In Jesus' name. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you.
Do take your seats. Um, just need a moment to get myself organized. <laughs> um, just where you're at, just say hi to someone around you. doesn't matter if you've said hello already today or not. Just if somebody sat alone, get up, walk across, seek them out. Good morning. Nice to see you. No, I'm not. <laughs> right. It's enough. <laughs> Um, we are carrying on this morning uh, our series, which we've entitled Deliver Us From Evil. We thought it was really important that we address this important kind of issue. You know, Jesus, what is he, he says, when, you, when asked how to pray, what, what did he say? This was part of his model prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we thought that it would be good just to spend a few weeks looking at what that looks like, what that means. Because actually, you know, as we've already reflected on today, evil is at work in the world, isn't it? There's all sorts of things going on. And let's be honest, we all wrestle and struggle with the temptations of the enemy. And we want to equip ourselves and each other to live free from those things and live more fully in the kingdom of God. Yeah? So that is what this is all about and we're, we're coming on to what I think is one of the it's just such a great passage to meditate upon and reflect upon if you want to think about the the amazing radical transformation that happens when you give your life to Christ so we're gonna have it on the screen if you want it in front of you have it in front of you Ephesians 2 Verses 1 to 10. As I read it, I just want to encourage you to meditate on this beyond today. Spend a bit of time thinking about it. I, I'd say write it out. That's what I do. That seems a bit odd, but I write it out. I write down and I think about each word. As for you, you were dead in your sin and transgressions in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, love that but. Best but in the Bible, I reckon. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness. Isn't that a beautiful word? In his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. 
It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. It's another way of reading that word is masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We pray together. Lord, we thank you that if we're sat here today having put our trust in Christ, something radical has happened in us. Something amazing has changed in us. We're not the people we once were. We're a new creation, born again. And Lord, we want to live according to that truth. We want to be the people that we know are, really walking it out, working it out. So help us this week and in the coming weeks as we think about these words. In Jesus' name. Amen. So what we have in this passage is who we were. I'm going to come on to this in a few weeks' time. I'm not going to talk about it today so much. Who we were. We were dead in our sin. We were distant from our our God who created us for a relationship with him. And we were destined, destined to a eternity apart from him if we continue in that state. But then it says, in Christ, when we trust in him, we are saved. We're saved from that. Salvation. It says we're seated with him in heavenly places And we're set apart. We've got this special purpose which he's called us to. Each and every one of us. But then what we have in this text, in this passage, and and this is why it fits in with our kind of series, is we have listed there three enemies of our souls. Three forces at work in the world today that can all the time seek to Drag us back from who we are and make us live according to who we were. I call them weapons of mass destruction. Because that's what they feel like. Anti-creation forces at work since the fall. Influencing and and impacting those who have accepted their influence and power. And it runs deep, doesn't it? It runs deep through creation. And then Christ on the cross came to limit their impact, undo their influence, and ultimately cause their destruction. It's the source of our deliverance, Christ himself. And there's three there. 2 verse 2 talks about the ways of this world. The world. The world is an enemy of our souls. And then it talks about the rulers of the kingdom of the air and the spirit at work in those who are disobedient. This is about the demonic forces that work in the world today. And then it says, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. You've got the world, the flesh, and the devil. When it talks about the flesh, it talks about who we once were. That's what it's referring to. Living according to who we were before we came to Christ. Now, we're going to look at these a little bit more detail in a couple of weeks. because so I want to kind of go in a, 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 in a slightly different direction. And I have to say, I wasn't planning on going here today. But as, it's, as I've thought about it and prayed about it, and as things have come together, I've been a bit wobbly, a bit shaky, but in time, I've got to the point of saying, yes, this is a word for today. Like, and I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about the word for today. <laughs> that one, I don't want it to seem like a kind of an academic lecture. And secondly, we're talking about difficult things. Difficult things. But I want us to be more equipped, both today and in the the weeks to come as we look at this passage, more equipped to resist the influence of these forces and powers at work in the world today. And more able to fully embrace the things of the kingdom in our lives and in our communities. These things which always lead to life. Always lead to restoration. Always lead to healing and help. 
always lead to the fullness of who we are in God being revealed. So today, I just want to look at Ephesians 2. Can we put that up, Shell? And the very first line, and the very, far, very first part of the very first line, as for you, you were dead. As for you, you were dead. And I want to look and talk about what I think is probably a destructive force fashioned against humanity that in Christ we have been rescued from, and that is death. We have been rescued from death. But I want to talk about that today. See, well, I was a little bit nervous about it. <laughs> Do you know, we were created for connection with God, weren't we? We were created for relationship with him. And in the connection, that connection, there is life. Because we are ultimately connected to the source of life. That's what we're created for. But then comes along, what comes along is sin and self-serving rebelliousness. And that came into that connection. And what that does is it creates a chasm, doesn't it? It creates a, a, a distance, a separation. We call that spiritual death. That's what Paul is describing in this first chapter. Uh, it, it's a spiritual death. And it's really serious. Because it affects us, doesn't it? It affects our life. Because when we... we we live oblivious and distant, oblivious to God and distant from that, that source of life that we're created for. It's inevitably going to have impact. It affects different people in different ways to different degrees. But ultimately, that the spiritual reality is the same. There is a death and a distance from God. Separation and distance. And then we bring the layer of physical death into the equation. And then we have the potential for that separation to become eternal. Death then truly becomes this weapon of mass destruction. I wonder if I, this is why Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. We've pondered that. Because Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead. He'd die again one day. But I wonder if this shriek, this outpouring of emotion of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus was a bit like Paul's groaning within as he lamented over the influence and impact of death on the world as he stood outside the tomb of his friend, as he poured out his grief. Tom Wright, I think, rightly says, death is a monster. Death is a monster. Death is horrible. Friends, I think death is the ultimate enemy of unredeemed humanity. And what it makes, what makes it so awful is that it leaves people without hope. It leaves people without hope. And when you don't have hope, I think you have, it's, can have quite disastrous effects. I'm going to tell a story, and uh, it's a sensitive story, and so, Rob, we're just going to...
Friends, I believe the ultimate enemy of, the death, of, of this world is, is death itself. And this ultimate enemy requires an ultimate solution, doesn't it? It requires a, 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 an ultimate intervention to stop this destructive power completely ravaging the earth. And his name is Jesus. Yeah? His name is Jesus. And through his own death and his resurrection, he destroyed death and robbed it of its sting. And what this does is it changes narrative. It changes the narrative of our world. It changes the narrative as we see hope being restored. And, and that's what I want to do today. I want to talk about, this is, this is where it's going to sound like a, a lecture. I don't want it to be that. Um, I want to talk about the history of death. But alongside it, I want to talk about the story of hope. Does that make sense? And to do that, as you can well imagine, I will use my trusty wife. Thank you for one who cheered. I want to do this timeline here where we have creation. And I want to say, this is a tricky one. There's conversations about whether there, you know, did death figure? If death is the result of decay, decay did not exist, and exist before the fall, then can we say no death? But even if there was death, it wouldn't be death that held any kind of fear or was born out of decay. So let's say creation, no death, and let's say pure hope, yeah? We all agreed on that. Are we all okay? I'm sorry. I just got to go with what I feel the Lord has given me. I know this is difficult. So what happens is the fall comes along. This is really not going to be to scale. Can I just say that now? Those of you who are scientifically minded or mathematically minded, you know, <laughs> I would have to have a very, very big whiteboard going <laughs> So the fall comes along. And the connection is broken. Okay, so the connection is broken, and what happens then is death is, is introduced. And what we have is this period of time between the fall, so there's this separation here, but then we have this period of time, this is where it's not going to work, but anyway. So we've got this period of time here, where the, the connection had been broken through the in introduction of sin and separation and rebellion into the human relationship with God. There's this humanity being detached from its spiritual source and goodness and, and, and there's this period where there's kind of death. It's like had, there was no way back from it, if you like. The separation is, is, is totally compounded by Death. There were some temporary things that were put in place. You think about the, the law and you think about the, um, uh, the sacrifices. These were just sort of almost signposts, were shadows of what was to come. But ultimately there was quite a, I think the word here is, is it was a bit confused. The Sadducees, who were some of the Jewish religious leaders, they sort of went along with the sort of pagan beliefs at, the, the, at this time, where death was a one-way journey. When you died, you died. But then some believed that there was a place called Sheol, which you read about in the Old Testament. And this was a place of the dead. And this is where everybody went. It was a sort of place of nothingness, if you like. There were a few that had some thoughts of resurrection, some thoughts of 
sort of something happening in the future based on Daniel 11.2. It says there are multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Some had this belief that one day death would be destroyed. It says this, um, he will swallow up death forever. This is in Isaiah. Sovereign Lord, the sovereign Lord will wipe away every tear from their faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. And obviously there was this belief in the Messiah coming, but the rescue that the Messiah was going to bring was about political and physical. It was about restoring them to a land and, and, and to an authority in the place. But, so it, I think it's fair to say that at this time there was confusion about what happened when people died. There wasn't a kind of a set, this is, this is it. And I think what happens when there is confusion in this way, and I think this is a fair, in terms of our story of hope going alongside this understanding of what happened when people died, is it, is it this time I would say that hope was deferred. Hope deferred. Anyone know the proverb? Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. So what happened then is Christ came along. Hallelujah. Death is defeated. And then hope is restored. Look really good when I did it on my whiteboard at home. It doesn't look so good now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> look. Jesus comes along and restores hope and defeats death. And there are a number of things that happen I just want to talk about. This is where it's going to feel like a bit like a lecture. I, don't, I hope it doesn't. Because this is really important to our faith, isn't it? This is central, this is core. This is probably an Easter Sunday sermon more than it is an end of October sermon. But resurrection is, is for every day. Okay, so what happens? A number of things that happened at this time that really help us understand the importance of this. This was tumultuous, this was massive what happened. See, what happened was is it went from confusion to consensus. Something shifted prior to Christ. There were all these different views about what happened when people died. And then suddenly, there's this sort of coming together. Yeah, there was a little bit of confusion about timing. Nothing new there. <laughs> but on the whole, there was a general view, consensus. Everyone agreed that Jesus had risen from the dead. That everything had changed. You know, the Christians at that time... Oh, I've lost my place, sorry, consensus. There was absolute consensus that Jesus had raised from the dead. There was no question of that. There was no question that there would be some kind of resurrection of those who had put their trust in him in the future. So there was, there was a consensus. And then what happened was is that this message became core, central to the church, Prior to this, the idea of resurrection had been muddled and peripheral. And then, this, and then when Jesus raised from the dead, everything changed. When Jesus saw him face to face in the garden, everything changed. When Thomas touched his wounds, put his hands, his finger in the wounds, everything changed. When Jesus ate fish with his friends on the beach, everything changed. When the hundreds of people, hundreds of people, all at the same time saw him, everything changed. This became core to people's experience of Christianity, and it still does today. Why? Because it was through this moment of overcoming that ultimately death was defeated, that hope was restored, that every sinful act that had divided and destroyed was dealt with. 
Christ took the judgment that should have been ours, that should have been mine, so that we don't have to. Took it upon himself. Took that judgment. And in doing so, he brought judgment on all those rulers and authorities and powers. We talked about this at our Imagine Leaders course yesterday. He took it upon himself, and what happened to him? He died. But when he died, those powers, and they, they thought they'd won. It was like there was a, a party in hell. But then there was this mighty, mighty move of God which raised Jesus from the dead. Death was beaten. That which had once divided and brought destruction had been taken away through the body of Christ. And now through his resurrection, he was saying, death, you no longer have the final word. That's why this is core. That's why this is central. Friends, our deliverance is rooted in that moment. Our deliverance is rooted in that moment. There was a recreation in that moment. One of my favorite poems is a poem called God Gazer by Malcolm Duncan. I don't know if anyone's heard it. It's beautiful and powerful and catches me every time I, li I, I listen to it. I want to read a bit of it to you. I want to be a world changer because on a morning many winters ago the tomb was open and the curse was broken. Death had to let go and recreation burst out of an old wineskin like water from a geezer. Like the cry of a child pushed into the world and nothing would shut him up. I want to be a world changer because it started. Because the vanguard's on the move and love is pushing out hate and light is shining out. And darkness can't understand it, beat it, change it, hide it, kill it, stop it, win. You know, the resurrected Jesus is the place where heaven and earth meet. He is the second Adam. A pattern for all creation from that point. There's a, there's a new pattern for resurrected humanity. This is a picture of resurrection life. At this time, we only know it in part, yes? We only know it in part. There's lots of passages we could read there, but one day we will know it fully, as we will be fully known. And in the meantime, in the meantime, we're in this period where recreation is taking place. There will be a time, I'm going to finish my drawing. Second coming. New heaven. I'll just put new, you know what I mean. No more death. Don't you long for that? Don't you long for it? No more death. Pure hope. A recreation is taking, taking place and it's looking forward to that. But in the meantime, we are being clothed, ready for it. No longer are we clothed with the filthy rags of our own righteousness. We have a righteousness, a rightness from above, received by the sacrificial death, through the sacrificial death of Christ, and sealed by his resurrection from the dead. And yeah, this is a shadow. This is a foretaste of what is to come, but it is coming. When that time comes, we will receive new incorruptible bodies incapable of decaying or dying. For the, imper the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with, the, with immortality. When the perishable has clothed, sorry, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, 
then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. Friends, sin has been dealt with. The power of sin is the law. Jesus fulfilled it. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we're being clothed. <laughs> Filthy rags of our own righteousness being taken away. Again, we talked about this yesterday, didn't we? He who had no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. He's readying us for this day, for this time. So there's a consensus, general belief. It's become central. This recreation is taking place. We're clothed, becoming ready for it. And then we are connected with him. Frank, you made a great quote yesterday. I was going to check it. Your quote about baptism. <laughs> and it was almost like I wrote it down. I can't remember it now. But it was about, there's no question about baptism. It's just a must. It's, yeah. Because when we are baptized, we are connected with him. I heard this phrase recently. I'm still pondering it. What happens to Jesus happens to us. We die with him. And we rise with him. We're raised with him. The old is gone. The new has come. We're lifted. Seated with him in those heavenly places. In baptism, we connect ourselves to him. Through his death, we die. Through his resurrection, we are raised with him. And because we're connected with him, we become part of what he's doing on the earth. Part of this recreation taking place. We become part of that. My final point here. Can I spell this right? Can I write it double L? <laughs> Look, I'm going to really... Can I just... I'm going to write this down. Collaborative eschatology. <laughs> All right, I know you can't see this at the back. Eschatology. I had real high hopes for this today. And it, collaborative eschatology. What on earth is that all about? Eschatology is about what happens at the end. Okay? Another way of saying this would be a realized eschatology. So what is happening here is coming into the present. Yeah? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're saying is, Lord, what will one day be sort of realized and seen in fullness, we want it to come into the present day. Yeah? We want to see it in our lives and in our hearts, in our families, in our homes, in our businesses, in our streets. What will one day happen, we want to see it coming now. We want to make ourselves part of that. That's where this collaborative eschatology comes in. Because we pray the prayer and we need to be willing to make ourselves the answer. <laughs> part of the answer. Your kingdom come. We need to act in a way that builds the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? It's what we've been talking about for the last two months at um, our emerging leaders. <laughs> the theology of the kingdom. It started in a garden that ends in a city. And we want to bring the reality of that into the present now. Readying us. Readying us for this. Because of the resurrection. Because we've been clothed. Because we're connected. And it's a work of his spirit. It's a work of his spirit. When we immerse ourselves in his spirit and live by the spirit, then that's what will happen. He will lead us into this. He will lead us into this. So these are some of the changes that happened through Jesus' ministry. 
through people's understanding and the teaching of, of his death and his resurrection. Everything changed. So what happened then is this is not going to fit. Oh, I'm so disappointed. So disappointed. So, so death is defeated. I'm just going to have to write it here and you're going to have to see it. This, this beca- it's now about living hope. Yeah? We don't have to live with this burden of death hanging over us because of what Jesus has done. Because he rose from the dead. Because we're connected with him. Because one day we will have resurrected bodies. And in the meantime, he has clothed us with righteousness. Does that make sense? Am I all right? Am I all right? (laughs) It means that we can have living hope. It means that whatever this life And all the brokenness of it may throw at us. We have living hope. We can carry that like a banner over us. This is what it says. This is what it says in 1 Peter. Blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I've remembered what I was going to write here. Life after life after (laughs) death. We may die, but we will go to be with him. And then one day he will return and we'll be part of the new creation. Yeah? We will be part of the new creation with the resurrection bodies that uh, Christ has made possible for us to have through his resurrection. This hope should impact all that we do. It should be embodied in our lives because it's a living hope. It should touch all of who we are. We sing it, don't we? No guilt in life, no fear in death. We're going to sing this song in a moment. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your body buried began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Friends, this is not just an absolute muddle. (laughs) This is not the history of death. It's the story of hope. This is not the history of death. It's the story of hope. And I want you to really hold on to that in this moment. This is the greatest deliverance from the worst of enemies. And it's there for us to know today. Today. It can be our living hope, shaping our lives and ultimately our eternity with God. Let's go back. Pop that up again, Michelle, will you please? Go back to where we started. As for you, you were dead. And if you're in Christ, you're no longer dead. You're spiritually alive, destined for an eternity with him. And you'll be part of this new creation, this new heaven. And this new earth. That's it. (laughs) Okay. Let's pray together. Actually, before we pray, we're going to sing this song.
I have no idea what was happening then. I need to address the elephant in the room. Because it's hard to talk about this without thinking about those who have gone before. And we don't know. We don't know where they put their faith or trust. And, it, and it's almost, you don't want to talk about it. Because... I'm sure that for many of you here, as I've talked about this today, that, that, that your thoughts and mind will turn to them. Is that right? Is that fair? 
can we simply entrust them to the Lord now? A merciful God, a loving God, who knows the hearts of people. I'm not making assumptions or statements. I'm just saying at this moment, it's easy to be drawn away from our celebrating the truth of what we know because of what's gone before. And we can only entrust these people to the Lord. Entrust them to God, to his mercy and his kindness. And to say he looks beyond and outside of time and space. He doesn't see things as we do. But he knows the hearts of people. Please, I'm not preaching a universalist gospel. I'm not. I'm just saying it's complicated. And there is more to it. Is that fair? Is that fair? And if we could just state and say that now, so then we can come on to what we really do know. And what we do have some say and control over, which is ourselves. We can celebrate the life that Christ has given us. The hope that he has made possible for us. Now, today. A hope that goes on into eternity. And it can be ours. If you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, stepped into that hope that that brings to our life, can I encourage encourage you? And urge you to just make that step today. To look to the cross. That God in his love gave his son. To do everything required. For you to be in relationship with him. And to walk out of that place. With the hope that is yours. That is ours. Maybe there are still those in the room today that carry a fear of death. A concern around these things and we just pray, Holy Spirit, come. Remove fear and replace with hope. Death has lost its sting. Mm -hmm. The ultimate weapon has been crushed with the ultimate, ultimate saviour. And now we want to partner with you, Lord. We've, we've, We've come into this connection through baptism. We've died and we have risen We've received this hope for today and for the days to come. And we want to pray and we want to say, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let the reality of what will one day be in full, and we know in part now, but let that increase amongst us today. Show us what that looks like. Free us from the things that hold us. Your kingdom come, your will be done. you Lord oh your mercy never fails me 
All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God all my life you have is running after running after me yeah. your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me come on sing it your goodness is running after it's running after your goodness is running after it, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after it, running after me. All my life you have been. to say this as we go on here uh, I celebrated my my proper birthday this past week and uh, there back on the 24th of October 1976 where I Jesus found me pulled me into his kingdom and uh, all those years I've been through a few challenges both of us have Mel and I and as a family but God has just been so faithful so I can sing this with absolute assurance and I'm sure you can too. So we go from this place with Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. If you have chosen Jesus as your friend, if you've accepted him as your saviour, then he lives within you. And you leave this place with that hope of glory within you. And you go to carry that hope of glory into this world. 
So we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what you did on that cross. And we thank you for what you are recreating within us day by day. And we invite you to shine your glory, your hope, into this community as we go from this place today. Amen. Amen. We do want to say, don't, please don't leave this place today. If you, want, if you have something burning within you that you wanted someone to pray with you before you leave, then please do come to the front and there will be people here who are really happy to pray with you this morning. Thank you.